Margot Finn. I'm the president of the Royal Historical Society, and it's a great joy to be welcoming you here today, or here and everywhere today. We've got a wonderful lineup of experts to speak to you today. A very brief introduction to our wonderful panel. Emma Brennan from the University of Manchester Press, who's waving at you now. Rodri Mokford from Bloomsbury Press, also waving um, at you at the moment. Professor Jane Winters from the School of Advanced Studies and the New Historical Perspective Series. Dr. Rob Waters of Queen Mary, who I can't see on my screen, but I think is here and you'll hear from later on. Dr. Neve Gallagher from St. Catharines College, Cambridge. Dr. Francis Houghton from the University of Manchester, waving now. And Dr. Stephen Spender from KCL. So really, really good to have all of you here. We're going to talk to you a little bit uh, for about 20 to 25 minutes about that transition from the doctoral dissertation to the book, how to affect it, how to make contacts with presses, what are the best presses, what's the peer review process like, and then my goal is to open it up to Q&A no later than 25 minutes before the hour so that we have a full amount of time for your questions. So we're going to start by asking that very basic question, initially of our three commissioning editors or series editors, what's the major difference between a doctoral dissertation and a book from your perspectives? So let me see. Emma, would you be willing to lead us off? Yes, thanks, Margot. I sure can. Um, just to introduce myself briefly, I'm the editorial director at Manchester University Press and I've been commissioning in history and the history of art and design for the last 14 years, which is something that is always surprising to me every time I have to say it, one of these things. Um, we publish quite a lot of first books and we're quite proud of working with um, recent PhDs to, uh, to help people to develop um, a project from a thesis into a book. Um, and usually the key, the key thing that we say is that we have, we have a, an awful metaphor that we wheel out for all of our um, thesis to book talks, which is uh, that the thesis is like crunchy peanut butter and a book is like smooth peanut butter. Um, so you've got this kind of the idea of the thesis as being um, a, a kind of a, a chunky item with a, a big literature review, breaking up the introduction. Uh, it's sort of an unwieldy thing. It might have big chapters with um, lots of individual numbered subsections, depending on what kind of discipline you're actually writing in. If you're more on the social sciences side, that's quite common. Um, and a book will be smoother in terms of its tone. Um, the way in which you kind of deliver your arguments is, is much, much more in kind of a, um, a confident authorial voice. So you're not necessarily breaking up the flow of your narrative by constantly invoking the words of others to, to kind of make your own points. Um, and the general sort of the structure and the arc of it will be elegant and subtle in a way that the thesis, generally speaking, isn't expected to be. Um, I think I, I should probably hand over to Rodri on that one because I'm sure he'll have different things to say. Uh, oh, thanks, Emma. Yes, well, I think you've, you've covered a lot of the, the big points there. I mean, when I was looking at the way uh, in which um, uh, Margot added that, that item to our, to our agenda to consider different things, what's the difference between a doctoral dissertation and a book? I think almost in one word, really, and everything flowing from that, the audience, you know, it's just, it's got a different purpose. Um, and that sort of, I think, is at the heart of it. And, you know, a lot of the, the, you know, the good detail that Emma's picked up there sort of um, points to that, I think, which is, you know, you're not writing the book to you know in order to obtain that phd you're writing it to kind of offer something new to the scholarly dialogue in the field you you know you're you've essentially um you've earned your you've earned your stripes and so it's not so much about trying to trying to prove yourself as it may be in, in a phd um you know things as emma said you don't need that kind of long uh, explanatory kind of surveying of the field sort of um uh, early chapter you can, you can strip things like that out and and you know bring in things like an introduction and a conclusion that really um you know get to the heart of of um, the arguments that you're making and the points and the contribution that, you, that your book is making is making to the field i think that that's key um there's a lot of other detail i mean i think that once you get beyond that idea of audience the two components then of structure and content there's lots of lots of elements that there then that kind of just need to kind of speak back to that change of audience um 
you know, I think that's the, you know, avoiding the passive voice, uh, avoiding repetitive material, uh, removing unnecessary long quotations, notes, that kind of thing, um, lends itself much more to a monograph than, than say, a PhD thesis. Yeah, there's definitely something there in the framing as well that we, we tend to, to try and get across as well, which is that um, a book project ought to really speak to broader narratives within the field. Like you should always be, um, rather than focusing in on your narrow case study that will have been for your thesis, um, it should be, it's a kind of a more of an outward looking project, you know how can we make this speak to the broadest possible audience rather than just as, as Roger was saying you know the, the very different audience that's expected for a doctoral dissertation. Jane do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I agree with everything that Emma and Roger have said <laughs> um, it's a, a much less dense much tighter publication than a thesis um, as has just been described and I think one of the things that um, the two editors uh, myself and Heather Shaw have noticed in the new historical perspective series is I think without exception the first drafts that we've had in have not um, stated early enough what the value of this research is and why it's important and that can why it connects to that wider context that Emma was mentioning um, there's a tendency to use the introduction to get some of the scene setting and literature review that you know you're not really supposed to spend too much time on um, out of the way whereas you really need to, to be upfront about why someone should want to continue reading your book and that's about the, the value what you're adding. I think in a, a doctoral dissertation by, by its nature you're trying to embed yourself desperately into the historiography whereas for the book you're already in the historiography and you're asserting your own particular argument and getting that voice, your voice, out there early on is really important. Uh, any other of our, um, our shortlisted candidates for the RHS prizes who want to add anything to that? Uh, not seeing any hands flashing on that. So we've had a really good start, I think, in which Emma has basically pointed out that writing a first book might lead to anaphylactic shock. Um, uh, that's not quite what she said, but you take my point. But I think that what's interesting is three different presses are singing very much from the same hymn book on this. They're really saying a similar thing, and I think it's true all the way across. You write your dissertation at the end of the day for the two people who are going to examine it, whereas you write a book for a much wider audience. What about this question of how you actually identify what the appropriate presses are for your particular project? One of the things I often tell my own PhD students is to read their own footnotes and to look for which presses their footnotes are pointing them to. But that's a very basic technique. I wonder whether, Rodri, maybe we could start um, with you and then go to Jane and then to Emma. But I suspect that our shortlisted uh, prize winners for the RHS may also have views on how they found their presses. Rodri. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the suggestion you make is a good one. <clears throat> and I think that, um, you know, similar kind of approaches in, in, in a, you know, in a similar vein is, is the, the best way of approaching it, you know, whether that's a case of speaking to colleagues, you know, I think that um, it's always useful whether that's in the department or whether that's at, at conferences, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting people's opinions because not only will you get the kind of uh, the website sheen of what, uh, what you might get from a particular publisher, but you might get more of a more of a warts and all uh, full full picture as to exactly what what the what the real life experience was of working with a particular press. If you know somebody that's published, checking websites, you know, looking at lists, you know, what what lists out there have the feel for for where a book like yours would, would have a good home. You know, where where can you see it see it fitting in? I mean, obviously, if if your book is on Spanish history and that publisher doesn't publish any Spanish history, that's not to say you won't have a good experience, but you know, all the things that flow from having a book that would sit with that list, you know, in terms of uh, marketing reach and everything else that, that that company could then bring, you know, those are things that they are, you're, you're sort of almost in a, in a, in a stealthy way, you're, you're learning about what that publisher can offer you then from, from that. So I, I'd say that those are, are, are good ways of, of going about it. 
Shall I come in? Um, and I, I, again, I would echo um, what Rodri said and uh, talking to colleagues, particularly your peers, actually, because a senior academic may have a very different experience to an early career researcher, especially if they've been able to build a relationship with a particular press over time. Um, because uh, you you want to know about the ones that uh, they may be great, but they may take an inordinately long time um, to get your book through peer review and to publication. And you want to know that upfront because you're committing quite a large part of your life to, to your first book and getting that published. Um, and I think it's also the case that it may even be that the series is more important to you than the publisher, that there may be a particular series and series editors that are really going to work well for you and that your book will get the visibility within that series that it wouldn't get as a standalone publication again as Rodri said in, in a, a, a with a publisher that perhaps doesn't publish a great deal in that area I think that's a brilliant tip actually to, to talk to people that you know I would also add though that if publishers that do more than one thing and have a variety of different editors working on different lists um, if somebody has published a book and has uh, an experience of a particular kind in say a politics they might have worked with a completely different editor and editorial team than they would have done had they been publishing in history. So just make sure that you're comparing apples with oranges, so to speak. Um, I actually, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I have a slide really prepared on this particular topic that really fits. So if you don't mind, I'll just share it. Um, this is something that I normally um, share, share during these sorts of conversations. Um, and it, it echoes a lot of what Rodri and Jane have already said, but um, it is worth thinking about things like what the publisher can provide in terms of your own, your own needs and expectations. Um, what cover price do you want? If you want this book to be 20 quid, you probably don't want to publish with a publisher that's likely to do it at 120 pounds. It is your first book and your power to negotiate on that front might be fairly limited, but it is worth thinking about what that publisher is likely to offer. Um, things like the production quality and visual material, for instance. Does your work need illustration? Does this publisher produce books that are highly illustrated? Will they work with nice papers? At, at this particular point in, in history, it's not easy to walk up to a conference stand and pick up and touch books. But um, in, in normal times, I would, know, I would have said, you know, actually go and, go and fondle the books and talk to the editors at um, specific conferences and, and see what's what. Um, thinking about the market for the book and what markets the, the publishers can reach, do they have distributions in the country, countries where you think your book will um, have the broadest appeal? Um, that question of how your work fits the catalogue, the, the issue of series is a really, really important one that Jane raised and that's, that's definitely worth considering. And then the other thing that I would say is quite important, and I'll stop sharing my screen now, um, is that question of what the, the publisher might expect of you. So we would expect you to prepare your own index, for instance, at proof stage. There are publishers that I know of who, um, and I only know this kind of by talking to people that I have published, who have published with them, who might ask you to pay for your own copy editing. It's not something that most of the reputable UK publishers will do, but you will certainly have that experience with certain um, academic European publishers, for example. Um, and it's worth thinking about whether you'll get free copies of your book on publication while they provide you with a PDF. Um, it's unlikely that you're going to make loads of money with, in royalties, but different publishers do have different approaches to all of these questions. And it is worth finding out on timeline as well. If you are on a deadline for some question of promotion or job applications or whatever, you probably want to work with somebody who is going to be able to meet your needs in that respect as well. The timeline is actually going to bring us on, I think, to our next question, though, for the uh, four authors shortlisted the RHS prizes, if you can wiggle into your um, advice that you're going to offer, how you, how you decided on your press, you're very welcome to do so. Timeline in part for publishing depends upon the peer review process. So I wonder if, um, beginning with Jane, moving to Emma and then Rodri, you could just talk briefly about the nature of peer review for the series that you edit, but also how long it normally takes and what the stretch can be between a short turnaround or a long turnaround. Jane. 
Uh, yes, um, we have a fairly standard submission process, I think, for new historical perspectives where there's a, a form online to fill out. And I do urge you, if the publisher has made a form available, to use that and not just send in something that um, that's easier for you, but it's much harder for the publisher to process and deal with and it'll probably come straight back to you. <laughs> um, and a sample chapter and a book outline with abstracts for each chapter uh, is out to two peer reviewers. And we normally ask them to get back to us within eight weeks. Um, they've been pretty good um, so far, um, but every once in a while, and um, particularly with everything that's going on at the moment, things drop away, people just aren't able to do it, and then you have to go and look for somebody else again, and it just adds another eight weeks onto the process. So you can see very quickly, it just takes one person dropping out, and you've immediately doubled um, the time that the peer review process is going to take. Um, I should have said that there's a, as a sort of quick editorial board check, um, not of the content of your proposal so much as its general framing and suitability does it look like we would expect a book proposal to look like before it goes out to that peer review stage so I think in general we get back to people within about three months um, with a decision um, but as I say that there can be hiccups and it varies at different times of the year it's much harder to get hold of people over the summer normally to peer review things than at other times of the year really helpful and obviously it's going to vary from press to press whether you can send the sample chapter or whether you need the entire manuscript Emma um, yeah we we also accept a proposal and sample chapters for books based on thesis research I always ask for the introduction and I always ask for a sample chapter it can't be a thesis chapter it has to be redrafted um, it doesn't have to be completely finished because obviously the point is to get some feedback from the peer review process and that's that's something that I'm quite militant about in my kind of approach to peer review. This is not the kind of a, um, you know, do or die sort of situation where they're good, you're going to get knocked down or waved through. The point is to actually engage and to have constructive criticism and, and we know that a book, any first book is going to need development um, and I'm quite prepared usually to see proposals through more than one round of peer review to get them to that point. Um, in terms of how we do it, we're single blind as well. We don't send the CV out, but that's for data protection reasons. Um, we, but quite often people include details of their previous publications and things in the proposal documents themselves, because we do ask for all of that. Um, our process, I try to get mine done within four to six weeks, but we are paying people a little bit of money or a few books in order to, um, to get them to do it more quickly and to persuade them. Um, I think the thing that takes the longest for us is to kind of make a decision whether to send it out or not. And that just depends on how busy the editor in question is usually. You know, if you've got a lot on your desk, the ones that kind of shine through as being really great prospects are the ones that go straight out for review and anything that looks like it absolutely doesn't fit the list will go. And then anything else that's in between might just take that little bit longer because you've got to go back and read it a few times before you can get there. But I would say, I normally expect to have concluded something within a couple of months. Um, but as Jane says, it's quite possible that people will drop out and you have to find somebody else. Um, so it can, it can extend for longer than that. And I have known processes go on for ridiculously long periods of time, like over six months before now. Um, fingers crossed that won't happen to any of you. Rodri, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, I think um, uh, both have covered it in quite a bit of detail there. So yeah, not nothing major to add. I mean, I think from by the sounds of it, our process is pretty similar to Emma's from the sounds of it in terms of turnaround times. You know, obviously we, we offer remuneration as well to reviewers, which you know sort of we, we hope kind of pushes that through a little bit quicker. So a four to six week kind of turnaround from the point at which we in-house have kind of decided that it's, it's something that we want to formally assess. And then you know we would then share that feedback with the author at that point. Um, you know, get into dialogue then as to as to what maybe uh, you know, could be adjusted or, or, or sort of incorporated as per the, the feedback and if at that point we're in a position where things look fairly um, you know fairly positive and I think we've got a robust enough case from the publishing board here at Bloomsbury I should be able to get a, a you know sort of a, a final green light uh, all being well within sort of six weeks after that and, and we'd be in a position to offer a contract on that basis. Um, I think Emma touched upon something really important as well which is I think probably what is the sweet spot when it comes to submission for sort of first book publication which is you know a detailed proposal plus a sample chapter ideally the introduction I think that 
anything you know a, a good detailed proposal can can win out if, if if you haven't written and haven't got a sample chapter ready uh, and the proposal is is is, is, is very tight and, uh, and and convincing um but i i'd always sort of subscribe to the idea of having a sample chapter if possible any more than that and i actually start to worry that things become a little bit more difficult to disentangle if there are if there are major adjustments that are being requested then you know it's, it's sort of not quite after the lord mayor's show but it does become a bit more difficult to kind of you know retrace your steps and, and reconfigure things if, if, if somebody's already presented you 90,000 words of, of, of written books so um there's almost a, um yeah sort of a, an over proofing stage if you see what i mean in terms of you know we'd rather see something a bit earlier than later i suppose Thanks very much. I think that's very helpful and very good to know that you're all on the same page uh, in many respects. One question that I know we've had at previous sessions such as this before is um, whether different presses are happy with a manuscript or a book proposal being out to multiple um, presses at the same time. Now with journal art articles that is a complete no-no never send a journal manuscript to more than one journal at the same time. There are a small number of book presses, and it is small in history, that are perfectly happy with multiple presses looking at your first manuscript at the same time. But I think it's fair to say in general most presses discourage that um, because of the amount of time and effort that everybody is investing in it. But if any of Emma, Rodri and Jane want to express contrary views to that, this is your time for expressing those contrary views. I would only disagree for trade books and even then I will ask for an exclusive if I possibly can get one because it does take time and you're paying people money and peer reviewers, peer reviewers aren't getting paid a lot, they're also incredibly busy. We don't want to use the, the kind of the goodwill that we have with them up on people who are going to be wasting our time in the end. It doesn't build great relationships with editors and you know it's it's not worth it really. If you if you know which publisher you would prefer to go with, just it, I would recommend going through the cycle of trying one and then and then the next one. Mm. I think it's really a case for your first monograph of serial monogamy. So that you know you may end up with multiple partners, but you shouldn't all at the same time. And um, it's a matter really of working your way through the list. Um, it's very tempting, I know, when you're at this desperate position of wanting to get your first book out. I remember what that felt like. But it really is penny-wise, pound-foolish to go for all of your presses in one fell swoop. You'll also get some feedback. If the first press knocks you back, you'll often get some good feedback, which will mean that the second one won't. We're going to move on now briefly to production and publicity. Um, the production process at your various presses takes about how long? And are there any tips you'd want to give authors in the age of Twitter, for example, and blogs, about how, once their books are in production, they can begin to build an audience? And I'm going to keep you very short on that so that we can move on to NHP and then the questions. Rodri. Uh, well, quickly on production, um, once we're sort of handing the manuscript over to, the, to our in-house production team, between six to seven months usually for, for our hardback monographs for you know, through, through to actual publication. Um, so that's a quick answer to that. Um, as far as the kind of uh, publicity marketing things, the key thing I'd hammer home is you know, make use of your own social media. So there is there is there is no room for for being shy or, or bashful in academic publishing or any publishing for that matter. That you know, self promote wherever you can because we and our marketing departments will assist and use all our usual tools. But there's nothing quite like getting out there and, and speaking about your own book and your own project to, to drum up interest. You know, you have the networks, you have the contacts. We as a publisher will support that and make use of them in our own way. But the the enthusiasm and the and the, the sort of uh, the drive that comes from from somebody's own some, somebody's baby, somebody's work is um, you know it, it really shouldn't be um, underestimated. I think it's fair to say. Yeah, it's the same for us. It's um, our, our production cycle. I should say is slightly longer six to six to nine months, maybe ten months if you've got a really heavily illustrated. Um, art history title or something like that, but you know, generally speaking, I think we're we're fairly similar. Um, and on the on the marketing side, I couldn't agree more. You you know, you are the people who know this topic best. You have the networks. You know the people that you want to get it in front of. Um, certainly, we provide, and I'm sure uh, Bloomsbury also also provide the um, authors with 
certain opportunities, things like Q&A questions that the authors are asked to complete. Um, when you return that information or you kind of write a blog post, we will put that stuff onto the MEP website and send you a link. You then will be able to run with that, tweet it, kind of send it to people, just get it out there, get it into your university um, departmental newsletters or whatever, whatever routes you can find to make sure that as many people as possible um, get to see your work and get to see the, the hard work that you've done on kind of framing it and making it attractive. Yep, exactly the same for me. Our production process is round about six months. And yes, anything that you can do to help um, will get your book in front of more people, um, particularly if it's an open access book where you, people can directly click on links and get through and read straight away um, and that you know there are no barriers in between. But don't turn down any opportunities that are offered if you possibly can. Um, although I think we all realise that you're, you're trying to establish careers and have got lots of other calls on your time. It, it's worth it if you can if you're asked to write yet another blog post for a departmental newsletter to to do it because it will pay off and that mention of open access jane gives us a very smooth segue into a few minutes from you about the new historical perspective series which the ihr and the rhs uh, publish collaboratively yeah um, as I mentioned earlier, I co-edit New Historical Perspectives with Heather Shaw and the series was launched in April 2016 and as Margot said, it's a partnership between the Royal Historical Society and the IHR, published with the University of London Press and supported by Past and Present and the Economic History Society. So you've got some quite some society clout behind this particular initiative. Um, it's an open access series which also has print on demand, um, paperback and hardback and it's specifically for early career researchers. It doesn't have to be a first book. Um, it's if you're within 10 years of your PhD and would like to publish with new historical perspectives, then it's available to you. And that's both um, what you would think of as a typical monograph, but also edited collections and even short, shorter form publications. Um, the process that we have, uh, it's, it's very small. We tend to publish around about five books a year. And that's, we're not really aiming to do much more than that. And that's because um, we sort of work with you through the whole process. Uh, if your book's accepted, you get an editorial board contact who will be there to help you with questions about the process of book publishing. How do I go about preparing my illustrations? What sort of permissions do I need? That kind of thing. And once we've got your first draft manuscript, we set up an afternoon workshop, uh, which will no doubt be virtual uh, for the next while, uh, with two experts in your field and your editorial board contact, and you get a really detailed going through of your, uh, your, chat, your manuscript to um, move it closer to being the sort of book that we were talking about at the start of this presentation. So you really do get a lot of support and input from experts in your field through the whole process. Um, pretty high visibility uh, for open access. Um, it's published through University of London Press, as I said. Uh, all titles will be reviewed by English Historical Review. There are chapter downloads on JSTOR, which really opens up your book to a different audience again, who are not necessarily looking for books in the first place, but can access chapters. Um, the first book in the series was published at the end of 2019, uh, which was Ed Owens on the family firm, Monarchy Media and the Public, which turned out to be rather topical. And Ed got a lot of opportunities to talk about the monarchy's handling of its interactions with the media in different, different places and forums. And then there's the benefit that people can go straight away and read his work or buy the book as well if they want to. The other two titles that have come out so far are Sam Manning on Cinemas and Cinema Going in the UK and Christopher Phillips on Transport Experts and the First World War. And his work on logistics also turned out to be quite timely in the context of Brexit. So uh, we work with authors to try and pull out these um, uh, hooks for, for promoting their work. If you're wondering whether your book fits, um, forthcoming titles range uh, right across from Masculinity in Danger in the, on the 18th Century Grand Tour, The Margins of Late Medieval London, Radicalism in the Spanish Second Republic, Deindustrialization and Scottish Nationhood, which is a wonderful oral history of the closing of the Scottish coal mines, and the Interregnum Church. So there's something for everyone, I think, and it would be wonderful to hear from you if you're interested in submitting a proposal. Thank you. That's, that's great, Jane. And uh, I think we've had uh, well over 3,000 downloads from the first titles in just a matter of months as well. I'm going to turn now to our four shortlisted um, 
early career authors for our two book prizes in the RHS. And Francis, I'm going to begin with you to see if you have any particular insights or a piece of advice you wish someone had given you that you can give to our 260 plus attendees today. Sure. Hi, everybody. I think um, my advice is quite pragmatic, quite boring, but there will come a point when your manuscript's been accepted that you will have to sign something that says, I've got permission to reproduce um, all my materials. And I cannot strongly enough advise you to get your ducks in a row before that situation. It's never too soon to work out what you need, what permissions you need from the archives. Some archives have slightly different processes. So I think in the event of avoiding unpleasant surprises, um, further down the line. Just have a think, have a check as to what your archives actually require by way of permission. That would be my advice. Really, really excellent advice and particularly toward the end of the process, it's horrid to have to work your way through those things because it's like doing your taxes several times over. It's, it's uh, very unpleasant, really good advice. Neve, what would you like to suggest? Yes, hi everybody. Um, but building on what Francis said, I think images and securing the rights for images are very important. Um, my book has got plenty of images and I had to spend quite a lot of time trying to find out who owns them, essentially, and did I need to pay them. So you may have to put up front some cash in order to do that, and that can be quite a long, difficult process as well. So start that sooner rather than later. And then the second point I'd like to say is about indexing. Um, so I chose to do my own index, and I know a lot of authors don't choose to do that. They'll pay a small fee for somebody else to do it for them. And that actually takes quite a bit of time as well, but you're not given a huge amount of time to do it. So I'd recommend thinking about the concepts that you might want people to see when they come to look through your book. Think about the different audiences and how they might use your book and jot those down as you're putting the book together so that when the time comes to do the index, either yourself or for somebody else, you've already thought out how the book will be used um, as opposed to having to think about it and then do it in the same time frame. Again, really excellent advice. Those concepts for the index, proper names are not a problem, but the concepts are really, really difficult. And bear in mind that you will be one of the people who will need to use your own index when you've moved on to another project. Um, Stephen, uh, we've got you on next, I think. Hey, yeah. Um, I found it really beneficial to have some space, some distance um, after the PhD. Um, and I know that's quite hard to do um, because the impulse is to try and get a book proposal as soon as possible. Um, but I didn't really um, do much work on the book for the first year after the PhD. And that was more by accident rather than design because I wasn't really sure how I was going to develop it. I'd, the project had lost uh, momentum a little bit. And but actually that time um, was beneficial because when I returned to the dissertation, I was more willing to make changes. Um, I felt less attached to the material. So I think if at all possible, um, give yourself some time in between the PhD and preparing the book material. Again, really excellent advice. And I think very often writing an article rather than trying to plunge directly into writing a book proposal helps to cleanse the palate. And I think that's a really important thing to do. Rob, you're up as our final person before we move on to the Q&A. Thanks, Margot. Um, I, actually, I actually have three things, but I'm going to say them very quickly. Um, the first one is that um, we, we've talked about peer review. I think it's worth saying that it is always kind of psychically dislocating to get peer review and it's not always nice to read reviews that might be critical. Um, they are hard to read. You don't have to agree with everything they say, um, but I think it's really useful to take time to absorb them and to try and kind of take the sting out of them and, and concentrate on the substance. The second thing I was going to say is that writing a book takes a very long time and potentially it can just take forever. So there will come a point at which you have to stop yourself and submit. And I don't think there's a single book published, the author of which doesn't regret some part of it or wish they'd had a bit longer to develop some part of it, but you do have to send it off at some point. And the third point I wanted to make is that I can't emphasize enough the value of a good editor. So try to get a feeling for what kind of editorial support you'll get. Um, ask around from others who've published in the same uh, press uh, with the same series or with the same editor uh, and just try and figure out how that relationship will work because it will really pay dividends if you find a good match. 
again, really, really good point. Letting go is incredibly hard to do, but unless you let go of the manuscript, it won't enter into the historiography. At a certain point, one has to draw a line. 